Come on, you know you want to do this. Put your hands together like this and just give them a rub. Some of you are cold enough to get the blood going anyway. Others of you just shows how excited you are. It's one of my most favorite parts of the, of the morning together. It's, uh, we've, our hearts are warmed. We can feel God working in our hearts. We've had a chance to worship him relationally through singing and connect with him through those verbal expressions. Then the actual uh, response to returning his tithe to him and expression of worship by giving and the, the things that just align our lives with him and, and the, the directions that he gives us to do so. But then we find ourselves at this spot and this is the time where we really intentionally open our minds and hearts to hear what God has to say to us through his scriptures. So I'm going to ask right now that if you'd go ahead and get your soap guide out, open it up to page 28, and I uh, want to let you know that we've fixed a problem that we've discovered in the guides for next month. We uh, had one of the ladies in the church that came up to me at the very first Sunday we used uh, the soap guides that we're using for notes. And she said, Pastor Dave, there's a problem. I said, what's the problem? She opened her book and she says, I've taken three pages for Sunday's notes and there's only one page in here for Sunday's notes, which means I got no place to write Monday and Tuesday down. And I thought to myself, right then and there, we're gonna fix that. And guess what? When you get your October guide, it's gonna be fixed, I promise you. But until then, just write on whatever you can and get ready to capture what God talks about. I'm gonna pray for you this morning and I'll tell you why. Um, we're talking about an area of our lives where darkness has had a free-for-all in the way many people live their lives. And so I've noticed in the last few weeks that there is some level of, uh, really it's a spiritual pushback. And so uh, the effectiveness of the next 25 to 30 minutes we're going to spend together does not depend on my verbal prowess to convince you of something. It depends on our ability to hear what God says to us by His Spirit. So I want to pray for you that you will be able to hear with spiritually open ears and hearts today so that the truth God wants to share with you can actually settle in a place in your heart that you can then actually let God transform that part. Does that make sense? So let's just open our hearts and, and let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we have done through our worship and singing and we've done through our worship and giving, we come to you right now in our worship of meeting you in your scriptures. And we just decide right now that our hearts and minds are open to hear from you. We set ourselves in agreement that our willingness to receive and hear what you have to say uh, will be done so with joy because you always bring news of how you make our lives uh, both redeemed and more powerfully effective as we as journey together in relationship with you. We agree and we take authority over darkness and decide that right now we set ourselves against any type of distraction and mental kind of rabbit trails. But Lord, we set our mind on you and I plead the blood of Jesus over this next few moments where we hear and sense and feel you talk to us and just declare in Jesus' name, it is fruitful for our growth and benefit. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. All right, if you're unfamiliar with what that is, basically all we did is just say, God, we wanna hear you and we don't wanna be distracted by any of the thoughts, all right? That's all that prayer was really designed to do. And so we just... Now, uh, we set ourselves to do that because we want to receive what God's doing. Everybody said? Amen. And the rest of everybody said? Yeah. Okay, so I grew up Pentecostal, which means I do need a little feedback. If you're not familiar with what Pentecostal means, you don't know what church is all about. But anyway, uh, it really helps me stay connected if I get a little amen or a little that's good or you go boy or just something along those lines <clears throat> to keep me going. If you don't give me any feedback at all, I think you're not listening, you're not hearing it, and it just makes me go long, and nobody wants to go long. <clears throat> so, all right, part four in the series, you are, you are, not you feel, not you think, not you wish, it's who you are. The reason I'm saying that is God, your heavenly father, created you. And he puts you together in a way that perfectly fits a great experience he desires to give you and something profoundly fulfilling and effective he wants to accomplish with you. He is a God who is and speaks truth we're the ones that often struggle with thoughts and feelings that don't line up with the truth of who he has created us to be. So this message is gonna go right at that. I want you to know in advance that I'm not gonna pull any punches, I'm gonna speak right to issues that actually hurt people's lives. 
This is not new age mysticism. This is not self-helpism. This is not any of those other things. We're going to look into the Bible, God's scriptures, and we're going to let him speak to us today. And I believe if you'll open your mind and heart, you'll sense God shifting some things around in you that will, that will align your life in a far better way to who he is and what he's created you to experience and to accomplish. So we're going to look at the, our three verses that we're using for the fall semester uh, as we journey through the series. The thir- first one is going to be, write this down, Romans 12.2. Romans 12.2, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And I want to open your, I want us to open this uh, verse again, even though it's familiar. I said um, a few weeks ago, this ought to be a refrigerator verse. And somebody sent me a picture of this verse written out on the refrigerator. And so if you want to write this verse out in your refrigerator, I think it's a great idea. So it starts and reads like this. The thief's purpose, no, that's John 10. I, can you guys put up Romans 12? There it is. You know, one of the hardest jobs in the whole church is running the screens for a, for a preacher who meanders like me. Can we just give our tech team a great hand? These guys are so amazing. I just love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way. Everyone say way. Way you think. In fact, I'm going to ask you to write that down, way you think. And I'm going to ask you to think about the way you think, which sounds odd in the beginning, but think about it for a moment. When's the last time you've actually thought about the way you think? You're like, what in the world are you even talking about right now? For example, most of the time, we tend to just roll with whatever ideas roll through our mind and we hold on to them as if they're actually true. And we've all experienced something like this. You walk into a room, people on the other side of the room, they, quit, they look at you and they quit talking. What's the first thing you think? They're talking about me. And all of a sudden, you're pretty convinced they're talking about you. And all of a sudden, this changes the way you feel. You start feeling insecure. You're looking at, you know, I have something on my face, something on my teeth. There's my hair going crooked. You know, what's going on? Gabe, that would not be your case. Your hair does not go crooked. Your hair is locked and loaded, man. Just say it. Dude, if I had a head that looked as good as yours, I'd, I'd be bald too. I'm just, I'm just on the records. No, I, I've seen my head. It looks like a Sharpay puppy. I will, unless I, unless I lose my hair, I will never be able to wear that dome like that, man. I'm just so envious and jealous. Lord, I'm just confessing my faults in front of all of my brothers and sisters. But we'll just like, we'll just roll with whatever thought and idea just rolls through our mind without thinking, hey, that thought is either a distracting thought or that thought is just like what I did a moment ago. That really didn't have anything to do with the message, but that thought rolled through my mind. I just went with it. Right? But that's what I'm talking about. Thinking about the way we think. Our thoughts are powerful, but most of the time we don't recognize it. So we just let them run and we just go with them and don't have any idea that often our spiritual adversary uses our thoughts against us. And we're going to look at that in a moment, but the bottom line I wanted to to say this morning in Romans 12, 2, is God does want to transform you into a new person by changing the way we think. And often we think about what that means is changing the thoughts that I think. And while it is true, I want to talk to you this morning about the way you think, which means I don't want to just let ideas roll in my mind and then go with them as if they're the right ideas. Because I could go with the wrong idea and suffer the consequence of going with the wrong idea. Or I could stop the idea and say, that's not true. Here's what God's word says is actually true. And as interesting or compelling or as tempting as that idea is, this is what's true, so I choose to align myself with what's true and I experience the benefits of that. That usually shows up in discussions, arguments, temptations, uh, when you're trying to do your homework. Whatever age you are, you're trying to do your homework, work at home. We'll be distracted, just roll with ideas. And God says, not the way I've designed you to think. I want you to, in fact, how many of you remember pray from last week? P-R-A-Y. 
that we pray about what we're about to do next. And obviously we're gonna talk to God about it, but that we use the words, uh, uh, the letters P-R-A-Y to stand for something. Would you go back to last Sunday? I'm not gonna ask you to repeat that in memory, but I do wanna talk about this just for a moment because part of the journey on Sundays, we're actually meeting God in his Bible. We're looking at the truth he's telling us about how life is designed by him to live, but we're also giving ourselves practical tools we can work with because it doesn't do us any good to be in, entertained on Sunday and not transformed by what we, by here, here by, by not doing what we talked about doing. So how many of you have got that open? What's P stand for? Pause and what? Evaluate. Remember, pause and evaluate. I find myself thinking about something. I'm feeling the agitation, emotion, temptation, whatever it is. I recognize, wait, that, those feelings don't go with how God designed me. To, so I pause the thought and evaluate it. Where'd that thought come from and is it true? And by the way, listen, this is a freebie. I didn't talk about this in the first service. It's free for you. True and fact are two different things. Something could be a fact and still not true. True means it actually finds its origin in God and his divine design, especially as it applies to you. Does that make sense? So true and fact are two different things. It may be a fact I want another cheeseburger, but the truth is excess is not good for me. Both in a way are true, but if I go with the fact, I'll get the benefit of another pound. Don't look at my stomach right now. (laughs) Got it? So we pause and evaluate. R stands for what? Refocus. Refocus. Once we recognize that's not how God designed me to think, to act, or to live, or to be, I'm going to refocus on what? What is true? A stands for? Align. Align what? Line my motives. In other words, I want the intended result of this to be what God designed for that truth to be actualized. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna desire that. So I'm gonna align my motives to that. And then I'm going to, what's why? Yield. yield, which means what? Yield to God's leadership. In other words, I'm gonna do what he says. So that was from last week's idea. Practical tool from last week's sermon. Why? Because God wants to change the way you think. If you don't do this, then the next time you're ticked off at somebody or you're oh, excessively tempted by something, you're just going to do it if you don't stop the, the train in your mind. Y'all see it? So God is saying, I want my people who have created to live above the temptation, the ability to be arbitrarily controlled by temptation, whatever that is to you, I want my people to be free of that. And the way they do it is that when they recognize darkness is in their thoughts, they stop they refocus, they align themselves with my motives, they yield to my leadership, and they experience the breakthrough that I've given them to experience the freedom of that. Now listen, this always works if you do it. It will not work if you don't. If you just know it but don't do it, it will do nothing for you. But if we know it and do it, then God literally starts transforming the lives that we live by changing the way we think. Don't give your mind freedom. You take authority over that mind. You drive your mind, you tell your mind, no, we are not thinking about that. We're thinking about this. But what do I do when my thoughts keep popping back on there? You just tell your mind, not that, this. But it's back again, not that, this. You've probably got a super neuro highway in your mind because you've thought about that that way for so long, you're going to have to retrain your mind. But you can because God gave you authority over your mind. Your mind does not have authority over you unless you give it authority. Got it? You're not a victim of your thoughts. You, you control your thoughts. I don't know who this is for, but I hope you are getting some good notes out of this. It definitely wasn't like this in the first service. They didn't get anything. Y'all picked the right service. So the way we think deals with the, the, the approach of how our mind works, our, our thought process works. But listen carefully to the next verse. Proverbs 4.23 says this, be careful what you think, because why? Your thoughts run your life. Now we're actually talking about the power of thoughts that affect our lives. So the way we think connects with the thoughts we think, because those two things together give us the lives we live. All right, not making it up. 
It's how God designed it to work. It's what we experience consistently. All right, now, when it comes to it, the, the third verse that is part of our series is John 10, verse 10. So that was Proverbs 4.23. We talked about Romans 12.2, Proverbs 4.23. Now we're talking about John 10, verse 10. John 10, verse 10 says this. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Okay, let's talk about that just for a moment. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. If you're taking notes today, and I hope you are, write the words steal, kill, and destroy. I'm gonna give you a couple of fill-ins to put beside those, okay? What he steals is truth. So beside the word steal, write truth. Right beside the word kill, what he kills is my hope. The believability, the hope. What he destroys is my life. Okay, real quick, I'm gonna talk you through this because this actually is what people experience without even acknowledging it, without realizing this is what happens consistently time over time and time after time. Our spiritual adversary steals truth But the way he steals it is pretty tricky. He steals it by putting in its place a rational lie. How many of you saw the movie uh, Inception? Okay, if you haven't seen it, the whole story is built on the idea that you could change a person's behavior and decisions by giving them an idea that they believe is their own through dreams. It took, about, it took Hollywood two hours to tell that story, but that was the basic story in about 15 seconds. Some of you are like, why don't you do that with your message? <laughs> Maybe I should try that sometime. Okay, but the idea is he steals truth by subverting it with a rational lie. Rational means a believable lie. So he'll put that in our thoughts, and if we just go with it, then we lose out on the truth. And then what happens is the next thing, if he steals steals truth, then it extinguishes our hope. Because over time, what we believe, anytime we follow a lie, it doesn't work. For example, if you'll just vape this, if you'll just smoke that, if you'll just watch this, if you'll just eat that, if you'll just take this, if you'll just date that, if you'll just quit that, if you'll just whatever, then you'll feel better. And then if you go with that thought, the rational lie, what happens ultimately is you discover it isn't true because the feeling, the circumstance, the situation, whatever it is, comes back again. So then we think, oh, we need a little bit more of that. And then we try that again. And over time, what happens is hope begins to be extinguished. Y'all see it? As hope begins to be extinguished, what we develop is coping mechanisms. So when we, when he kills the hope, what we end up doing is developing coping mechanisms. But ultimately, what is destroyed is our life. Now listen carefully. I've been an ordained pastor for over 30 years. I preach a lot of sermons. I'm old. (laughs) It's official. All right, now here's the, the reason I'm saying that is because I'm far enough down the road, I've discovered what actually changes people's lives and what simply entertains people. I want to see your life changed. I don't care if you like what I'm saying or not. I want to see your life changed. I've seen too many marriages become destroyed for just this thing. The enemy throws an idea. I wonder what that old girlfriend's doing now on Facebook. It won't hurt if I just click on, what, what was her name? Oh, that was, who's she friends? Oh, I bet I could find her on Facebook. Got it? 18 months later, you're divorced because you didn't recognize a lie. You just went with it. Got it? It, It's how it works. It's how it works every time. I'm not mad at anybody in here. I'm mad at the devil. Got it? I want to see you win. I want to see you free. That's, and God does too. He designed you to live that way which is why we're actually t- 
tangling with this at face value. We're going right at it. Okay. So the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he do? What does he steal? Come on, let's say it together. What does he steal? How? By replacing it with a rational what? Right. So what does he steal? By replacing it with a rational Okay. What does he kill? So we develop a coping mechanism. But it doesn't work. It actually destroys our what? Life. Everybody see it? promise you, if you pay attention to this, you'll watch God literally transform your life. Got it? it. Okay. So that's the the three verses we're using all the way through the fall. And this is probably going to be so repetitious. It's just going to get mind numbing after a while, but don't quit coming on Sundays because you think you know it, because every time we get here, God's going to show you something different. And it's all pieces and parts of the puzzle of what he's wanting to show you the picture of. All right. Now, when it comes to lies, the reason we're working on this is because there is a, there is a, a kind of a group of lies that tend to fit most people, at least two or three of these that we're going to be talking about fit most people in ways that debilitate their life in some way or the other. All right, week number one, we talked about the lie that I'm not good enough. You guys remember that? Okay. Maybe that's not the one that you struggle with. But I guarantee you, there's people close to you that their life is debilitated, they wobble, they cope a lot because they're believing that lie. And we talked about what God's truth said about it. Last week, we talked about the lie that I'm unloved or unwanted. Right? Maybe that's not the one that gets you wobbling. There's a lot of people that develop coping mechanisms And they just can't feel like they're ever good enough. And so their coping mechanism, well, if I'm not good enough for you in this marriage, maybe somebody else will find me good enough. And whatever it else is we're talking about. So I promise you these are real issues. They're not just made up, they're not just made up things. Today, we're going to actually talk about the lie that says I'm insignificant or I'm broken. I'm defective in some way or I'm invisible. I'm insignificant, invisible, or broken. Something's not right with me. Okay, maybe you're thinking, oh man, come on. That's not me. Maybe not. But maybe there's, this is a little closer to home than you think. Let me tell you the two two categories of people that often find, based on these two categories, a susceptibility to these type of uh, thoughts that cycle in their mind. Typically creatives, if you're a creative, you know what I'm talking about by creative, you're an artist of some kind, a composer, you write things, you create things, you're an actor, you're a musician, um, you're, but you're in front of people, or you develop things for people, you're creative. Maybe you're a chef, I have no idea, but, but you're, you're, you write blogs, but you're, you're creative. If you're a creative, there's a part of you that's designed to connect and inspire, with, to, to inspire people but if you're missing a piece, and I'll talk about this in a moment, you actually look to that issue as an, a sense of affirmation. And if you don't get it, then you feel insignificant, invisible, or broken. You look, feel, uh, and often people like that struggle with uh, a, a melancholy type added, uh, demeanor uh, where that's a real struggle. And I want you to know this morning, if this is a lane that you find yourself struggling with, then you're in the right spot today because God's gonna bring you some truth that's gonna set you free. Another category of people that tend to struggle with this particular susceptibility of thoughts like this are people that have struggled with abuse or abandonment. Abuse means somebody in an authority position, a position of influence or authority over you did not guard or take care of you or protect you, they they used you. Abandoned means that that group, that type of person actually left you and you felt vulnerable unnecessarily. Does that make sense? Can y'all see how either of those two categories would give a person the idea that I'm not worth it, I'm insignificant, I'm invisible, or I'm broken, deficient? Okay. So I just want to connect with you and let you know that if either of those areas touch a spot of your life, that we're going to talk about what that lie tends to make people do in response to that. And then we're going to talk about what's actually true of you from God's perspective of who he's created you to be, because this is all about who you are, not how you feel, who you are. 
When we find ourselves struggling with the lie, I'm insignificant, I'm, I'm invisible or plain or defective or something's broken with me, we tend to either respond to go straight to coping and that tends to be an addictive cycle of some kind where we, we tend to find addictions to relationships, substances, or experiences in a way to try to offset that. Or we struggle with envy. We envy people who seem to be getting attention from others. We try to figure out why are they more effective? Why can, what, what, what is it about them that makes them get more likes than me or more compliments than me or more whatever it is? So envy tends to be a, uh, a struggle. Envy causes us to crave the attention others receive because we truly believe, listen, that, we, that if we receive that, it would silence the voice of insignificance in our mind. I'm saying envy not because you want some stuff, it's because you want what you think that response would do, which is silence the voice of insignificance. It won't. It won't. One of the illustrations that I was using in the first service is that of theater. When you've been to see theater, you, you see actors and actresses uh, performing and they're doing all, all the stuff that they do to tell a story. And just, if it's compelling, people clap and they cheer and all that. But at the end, the cast comes out, what do they do? They take a, take a bow, all right? And in that moment, typically, whether it was actually good enough to cheer and clap or not, there's an obligatory sense of response. So inevitably, everybody's clapping and you can see in the eyes and faces of a lot of people who live in that world, this is, this is why I do this. This is why I do this. Look, they see me. I'm not, in, I'm significant. I touched somebody. I inspired somebody. I did this. I did that. I'm significant. I'm seen and I'm good. I'm not broken. I'm defective. I'm effective. But it only lasts as long as they clap. Right? Within moments of walking off stage, that feeling of satiation, that feeling of satisfied evaporates and they're left wanting what? More. Now, I'm just using that as an illustration. If you're in a the theater, please don't think you shouldn't walk out and, and uh, that's not the reason I'm saying that, okay? So, but here's, let me give you, because I just all of a sudden felt like I hope nobody's in theater in here and they're like, should I go out and take a bow or not? <laughs> yes, you should go out and take a bow. But here's what I want you to understand. God designed us where affirmation fulfills a part of our experience, but what it doesn't do is satisfy. Here's what I mean. Let's, let's just say, for example, that God created you with, with that shape. Oh, I'm ahead of myself in the message. I hate when I do that. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Can I leave you all there on the cliff just hanging? Yes or no? Do I need to tell a funny Pentecostal story? Or can I just move on? Okay, let me just move on. Craving the attention that others receive because you truly believe it would silence the voices of insignificance in your mind. Or it can actually cause us to go to excessive extremes to prove to people around you that you matter and aren't defective. So we, sometimes we go to extremes to prove that we matter or not, and are significant by things we do with our style, our lifestyle, um, the, the things that we put around the edges of the accoutrement of our life, the toys, the things that we look to to prop up our sense of social acceptability, those kinds of things that, that we believe will make us seen, notice, and significance and feel, and feel significant. All right, so what I mean by that is if acting and pre presenting is not, but you still find yourself in this category of wobble, then the excess you may reach to is not performance, but it may be excessive spending. Maybe you think, I need, I need two more outfits because if I just get those two outfits, then I'll just look so good. So good. So good. 
Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend 30 more minutes at the, gyms at the gym because if I can just get those biceps an inch bigger, then I can, mm, boom, you know it. Just 30 more minutes of the day. Never mind what my family needs. Just 30 more minutes. Or like the guy, or, we'll, or listen, sometimes you believe the rational lie that you, you'll sign a credit card application because you think it'll just give you a little bit more margin and everything will be better because... I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever done that. But the reality is that's a rational lie. And we just think, oh, it's just, you know, 30 bucks a month. Anybody can handle 30 bucks a month, but you got six of them. There's an old commercial uh, years ago about a guy, and he was driving through a real nice neighborhood in a beautiful brand new car, and he pulled up in this mansion of a house and it was landscaped and, and uh, pretty soon you saw him drive through the neighborhood, drive in the driveway, getting out, he's got his, his sharp clothes and he walks in. Then the next thing you see him, he's driving up and down, mowing his lawn on his big, beautiful uh, uh, John Deere tractor, you know, he's going back and forth and all that. And he's smiling and all these other things. The whole time that that scenes are playing out, he's like, here I am, look at my neighborhood, look at my brand new car, look at my house, isn't it wonderful? How about my lawn, it's amazing. And then as they're going through all these things, the next thing he says is, I'm in debt up to my eyeballs, somebody help me. <laughs> you know, it seems silly when you think of those examples, but it's actually what we tend to do if we don't respond to this sensation correctly. We'll do something like that. It may not be that issue. It may not be spending or excessive time at the gym or buying too many toys, or it may not be you know, plastic surgery, or it may not be, I, I have no idea what it might be for you. It may not be any of those specific things, but if we don't actually see behind the lie, if we don't see the truth behind the lie, we'll actually let God and all that he paid for, uh, just sit there on the shelf and never tap into it. And God's telling you, I bought and paid for the solution of what you actually need. And it's given to you. It's given to you. So, the reality is, the lie that many people struggle with who are either creatives, or they've suffered from abuse or abandonment, is I'm insignificant, I'm invisible, or I'm broken. And we tend to cope with it by doing all kinds of crazy things that we think will actually satisfy the issue of significance. And all it do, does is take you down a trap. But I've got some really good news. I've got some mind-blowing, life-altering, shundai rundai, untie my bow tie, Give me the keys to my Honda. Good stuff. This is going to come right out of the Bible about who God actually created you to be. The truth is, God created you unique. You are special. You're like, hey, if everybody's special, that means nobody's special. No, that's what I'm talking about. God created you unique, special, and he created you perfectly. I want you to listen to how God actually sees you. In spite of the fact of how you feel, I want you to see how God actually created and sees you. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I love this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I'm reading the New Living Translation. says this. For we are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. I know what you may be thinking and feeling right now because I see the quiver in your lip and I know you're struggling and fighting to understand, but I want you to know right now that regardless of how you feel, whether you feel guilty, condemned, whether you feel uncertain, confused, maybe you're feeling anxiety, I have no idea what you're feeling right now, but I want you to know how God sees you. He sees you as his masterpiece. God saw you perfectly. He shaped you perfectly. He knows exactly what he's created you to experience, to be, and to do. And God doesn't make junk. He created you perfectly. You are his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Now listen, I know that sounds like a big... You know, I want to wave my hanky and say hallelujah line right there. But listen carefully what he said. He created us new, anew, where? 
in Christ Jesus. In other words, if the in Christ Jesus isn't there for you, there is no wonder why all you can do is cope. But God brought you here to say, I know the answer to the gap in your life. I am the answer to the blank in your life. If you'll let me in you and you're in me, you're going to experience what that promise says. You are God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us so long ago. In other words, God framed you with a divine shape and a divine purpose that is perfect for you. And in relationship with him, watch this, where he is your fullness, you'll be able to do everything he created you to do from a position that's already full. You're like, I don't understand. What does that mean? Now let me go back to what I was talking about a minute ago. When we don't have Christ in his place in our life, all we can do is manipulate the people in circumstances and environments around us to prop us up on the outside, hoping it'll fulfill something on the inside. But it can never fulfill it on the inside from a lasting position. That's why I said a a moment ago, it feels great if they're clapping for you, but that feeling is gone when they quit. Got it? It was wonderful when they put that gold medal on your neck. You felt absolutely invincible until you got home and realized nobody cares about that gold medal. Now people do, but that's, you know what I'm talking about. If Christ is in his place in your life, then there is not a sense of craving we need from outside because God actually provides something from the inside that stops the power of crave from the outside. Listen carefully. You know how the best, you know the best way to control somebody? Make them want something. The best way to control a person is make them want something. As soon as a person wants something, you've got leverage over them. You probably never thought of it that way before, but I'm telling you something that will set you free. If you live your life from a position or a posture of want, which means I desire this, I desire that, I desire this, I desire that, I desire that, I want that, I want that, I want that, I crave that, I crave that, I crave that. I need to feel seen, I need to feel significant, I need to feel okay. I I want, I want, I want. If you live your life that way, You've got 13 hooks in your nose. No wonder your life is so out of control. Why? Because you're living your life following want. How many of you have ever read Psalm 23? Psalm 23 starts out by saying, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then he goes through this long list of wonderful things that are only true if the Lord is your shepherd. What does that mean? I no longer follow want, I follow Christ. You're gonna follow something. You either follow Christ or you follow want. One of them will fill you, it is not want. Want will leave you wanting more. But if you follow Christ in a relationship, there's a profound promise that is yours and I'm gonna be done in moments. Do not leave me, do not quit listening. I promise you, within the next 90 minutes, I'll be done. (laughs) In Christ, God designed you to live and to be your best in relationship with Christ not religion relationship relationship with Christ now listen to the next two verses I want to share with you 
The first one is, that, and it lines up perfectly with what God's trying to tell us about this. John chapter 15, verse four in the New International Version says this. Remain where? In me. So here's you, here's Christ. You remain in me as I also remain in you. You know what that's a picture of? Relationship. Nothing to do with following rules and religious expectations. Relationship. Remain in me as I remain in you. That's the relationship. Why? Because no branch can bear fruit by itself. In other words, if you're out here looking for a result, you cannot produce that result unless you're in the vine. And that's the branch of the vine. You it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And there's like, Pastor Dave, I don't understand. What is it talking about? Here's the simple piece. I want you to see it. You remain in Christ as Christ remains in you. In that relationship, there is something called bearing fruit, which fruit is a biblical picture of producing a result that you could not produce by your own best efforts. There is something that happens in the context of that relationship, only in that relationship. Can okay, watch this. This is so, if you don't jump up and shout hallelujah when I read this next verse, I'm not coming back next Sunday. I'm just kidding. But you're free to actually emote a little bit if you want. He goes on, he, he goes on teaching, and then in verse 11 says this, I have told you this. What did he tell you? What I told you in verse four. I've told you about you remaining in me and I remain in you. I've told you this so that my joy may be where? In you. And your joy may be what? Complete. Mm. Okay, watch this. Thank you very much. About six people just got breakthrough. It's awesome. Okay. I'm going to read this with a little amplification on it. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that as a result of my joy being in you, your joy, which is the experience you have, will be complete from the inside, not depending on the fickle nature of people's opinions and circumstances in life that can change in an instant. If I'm in you and you're in me and we stay that way, I bring my presence in you and guess what I bring with you, with me? I bring my joy in you. Now watch this. When you're full of joy, you don't need anything. Okay, now watch this. Go back to the actor illustration. So let's say God created me as an actor, which he didn't. I can't dance. I can't act. You know, I can barely preach. So this, I'm doing my best at this. And, I, and so there you have it. <laughs> but let's say I act and I'm doing all this, these wonderful things and, I, and I, I'm able to do this, but I'm doing this from this posture. In other words, I'm in Christ. He's in me. Our relationship is white, hot. His joy is in me. I go through, even if I've got melodramatic lines, Look what has happened in my scars. <laughs> See what I'm not an actor? Okay, so anyway, let's better say I did a moving presentation and spontaneously people just erupt in emotion and people are standing. Oh, and you know what happens on the inside? Nothing. You know why? I'm already full. The only thing that can happen with what's coming at me is I can say on the inside, God, thank you for the ability to inspire and touch people in a way that reflects who you are. I'm so grateful you chose me and shaped me this way. I'm gonna act for your glory every time. And people say, then that was a great thing you did. And that was so amazing. I'm gonna say, God is so good. Don't you just love my God? <laughs> See, when I, or, or I could do, I could fly airplanes that way, or I could pump gas that way, or I could serve Starbucks that way, or I could go to school that way, or I could preach that way, or I could do life that way. I could have an argument or discussion with my wife or husband that way. I could raise kids that way. In other words, once I'm full on the inside, I need nothing, which means nothing can control me. I'm free, but not because I've learned how to act free, like, oh, I'm free. 
but it's because legitimately on the inside, Christ is in me and I am in Christ, the picture of relationship, which means his joy is in me. I don't need an illicit relationship. I don't need to sleep with anybody other than my wife. I don't care how hot you are and I don't care how good looking you think I am, which is not the truth. But the bottom line is, I don't need that. I don't need your money. I don't need your affirmation. I don't need any of that stuff. And you shouldn't need that either. See, that's what Jesus paid for. When he hung on the cross, it wasn't to get more followers and build a great world religion. He did all of that to purchase freedom for you. Healing for you. God wants to take what the enemy meant to destroy your life and mop him up with freedom. Ooh, that's good preaching. Hey, if you're visiting with us at LifeLink, I don't normally get all Pentecostal like this, but every once in a while it just pops out and I can't really help it. But I hope you're getting the message is the bottom line. Y'all, y'all got what I'm saying? Listen, here's, what the, here's the whole story. There is a real lie of you feeling insignificant or being insignificant, being invisible or being broken. That's not true. That's not, God created you perfectly as his masterpiece, but your experience of that is only available in a real relationship with him where you learn to let him bring his joy and fill you up on the inside so you need nothing. And in that position, you can do all the great works God created you to do. Got it? Man, come on. This is good stuff. So I'm going to give you a couple of practical tools. Remember, we talked about pray last week, P-R-A-Y. Let me give you two practical tools that will help this particular wobble spot a little more effectively. All right? And this is just aimed at helping this particular spot. This is something of practical tools. The first thing is relationship. I promise you, if that relationship is not real and or real strong, today's your day. Can I just say this? In a moment, and if you've been around LifeLink more than two weeks, you know, we pray the invitation prayer every Sunday. If you need this in increasing measure, then when I call for hands and you know you need to deepen your relationship with Christ, why would you not throw your hand up and say, I'm giving my life to Christ again today? What have you got to lose? Your pride? Nobody cares. Nobody's judging us. If we need to start fresh with Christ, let's start fresh with Christ. Let's just go there and get baptized and do all of it. What do you got to lose? Right? Aren't you sick of living the way you're living anyway? You might as well have it all. I don't know why I'm talking this way. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> okay, practical tools. Practical tools. Number, number one, if this is a wobble spot for you, I'm going to suggest that you would actually do this. Take a break from Envygram. Like, I don't, I'm not on Envygram. Yes, you are. It's called Instagram. It's AKA Instagram or Facebook, or social media. If this is a wobble spot for you, I'm going to suggest that you take a 21 day break from social media. You're like, are you kidding? That's where I get all my likes. Here's what I'm going to suggest. Delete the app, all your data will be there. When you sign back in, it'll all come back with all the likes and everything. You're like 22, day 22, you just like getting a sugar rush. You're like all those likes will be there, right? You can go look at all of them. But for 21 days, turn it off. Pick up your phone instead of going to Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or whatever you go to for, for all of that stuff. Instead of that, just call someone on that phone. Like, like a person like a real person and talk? Not a chance, Pastor Dave. I'm tell, trust me on this one. Pick up the phone and talk. Here's, here's what I, you know what I know? You're gonna spend an hour on Facebook or Instagram anyway. You'll spend an hour on it. Why not pick up the phone instead of opening that app, go to your contacts, figure out who you're supposed to call, say, I'll meet you at Starbucks in five minutes, let's talk. Talk for 45 minutes, say goodbye, Drive home for five minutes, you've saved 10 minutes, and you've actually connected with someone. It's astounding. Your life will just change in a second. Try it. 
I can't, next week, I hope three people come up and say, Pastor Dave, I turned Facebook off and I actually went to Starbucks with somebody or had them over to my house. I told them, you got 45 minutes to talk and you're out of here. <laughs> Listen, don't be a Klingon. Don't, go, don't stop. Don't go there and talk for hours. Just 45 minutes is all you need. I'm just kidding. But y'all want to talk about connect. That's actual connection. You're going to discover that God does something powerful when people connect with actual people. Got it? And the second practical tool I want to give you and then we're going to actually be dismissed is this. When you feel envy or the, the, the results of this particular lie that I'm talking about start working in your heart, pull out anything. Journal's best, but anything you can write on and start writing down, God, I am thankful for, and I don't care what it is, that heartbeat. God, I'm thankful for that breath. God, I'm thankful the fact I can read and write. God, thank you for the ability to have a sound mind. Thank you. Listen, you may be in a terrible situation like your electricity is getting turned off and it's 105 degrees outside or you're losing your car, whatever it is. Don't thank, listen, that you're not thanking for circumstances. Just, God, I thank you for this. I thank you. Whatever you can thank him for and what that does is it literally stops the, 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 uh, the, the central line of envy that's coming into your soul. Gratitude is the antidote for envy every time. Thank you for this. Thank you for my husband. I don't even like him. He didn't say like him, just thank him. Thank God for your husband. Or thank God for my wife. Don't like her either. Well, that doesn't say, you know, no, you never, never did it say we have to like each other, but we do have to love each other and thank God for each other. So, right? Now, it helps if, you love and, if you're lovely and likable. And all. So be likable in your marriage. It will be easier. But thank God in writing. And then when that wave goes by, you just say, God, thank you for that. And the next time that, that wave comes up, instead of actually sinking down in that cycle, say, nope, thank God for this. And I'm gonna encourage you to thank God. Don't just say, I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for. Make it personal. You and God, He is your source. Got it? You guys get something out of this today? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for being good to us. You're such a good God. Lord, thank you that we have the ability to hear who you are in the truth that you've revealed yourself in your scriptures. Today, God, we have heard you, we've sensed you, we've captured your thoughts. I'm praying, God, for a, a release of courage in this room today. For the benefit of life change. And I'm asking, God, that you would touch people's lives with a sense of hope courage and hope that changes our lives and I thank you for it in Jesus name with your heads bowed and your eyes closed I do want to just connect with those of you that know that today you're making a decision to follow Christ even if it's following him in a new season and I do want to encourage you to be responsive to this if that's you and you know it's you I'm going to ask that you slip your hand up in just a moment I'm going to count just leave it up until I finish counting so I can connect with you and know who I'm praying with and then we're going to be dismissed one you already know who you are <clears throat> I don't have to talk you into it, too. I won't embarrass you by asking you to stand and come to the front or anything. But when I say three, I'm going to just ask you to throw your hand up and let's start this together. Ready? Three. So if your hand up and leave it up just for a moment, I'm going to kind of count across the room. If there's one, leave it up just for a moment. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Anybody else? Eleven. Who else? Okay, thank you. You can put your hands down. There's 11 people saying yes to Jesus today. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me enough to tell me the truth in your Bible. Jesus, thank you for loving me enough to die on the cross to pay for my sins. I'm asking you to wash me and cleanse me and forgive me for every sin in my life. Come into my heart, the core of who I am, because I'm choosing to follow you as my God, my Savior, and my Lord from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, you guys. Let's celebrate what God's doing today.
Thank you for watching the LifeLink Church video podcast. It is our prayer that you heard a word from God today. If you have a story to share about how God is working in your life, then let us know and send us an email at mystory at lifelinkchurch.com. 